Good whenever, dear viewer. I'm David Wiltshire from the University of Canterbury, and I've been working on foundations of cosmology, foundations of observational cosmology uh, for 19 years at least. And what I'm going to present today is the result of work on what I call the timescape cosmology, and it appears to be finally coming to fruition. I'm going to make an extraordinary claim today and not relates not only to the cosmic coincidence problem, which has been there lurking in the background as motivation for this approach and for many other approaches in inhomogeneous cosmology, but I'm going to make a claim that actually I now understand why we put in a cosmological constant. Of course, it is not real, it is not there, but it is serves a purpose, and that is it is a counter term. It balances the all-sky monopole average kinetic energy of expansion of negatively curved voids, which initially very tiny, but come to dominate the energy budget of the universe at late times. So um, to put this together, one needs ingredients. One needs a an reasonable uh, initial matter power spectrum as constrained by the CMB. One does need back reaction of inhomogeneities. In other words, if you use all of Einstein's equations, not just the Friedman equation, but actually go back to foundations, then the average expansion does not have to be Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker. It could be something else, and that is necessary. Um, but in addition to that, you also need some other extension of the ideas of Einstein, an extension of the strong equivalence principle to the cosmological equivalence principle, I claim. Uh, and that invokes a particular qu condition, the quasi-local uniform Hubble expansion condition, and that is required. Um, all of these things immediately, you can e easily get rid of the Hubble tension, uh, but can you do it um, in a compelling way? Well, if you need a takeaway message from this talk, uh, as displayed on the buses in Christchurch, uh, we, we are K net C kinetic, and uh, it is the gradients of the kinetic energy in, of expansion and full general relativity, which are not Friedman. And those gradients can generate something which we mistakenly identify as a cosmological constant or as a dark energy of some other nature, which also has to somehow obey Friedman, even though GR doesn't. Extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence, and some of that is going to be presented by five very talented students who are talking today. Some of their talks are not related directly to what I have to say, although indirectly they certainly are. Uh, so in particular, watch out for the talks of Zach Lane, Chris Harvey Hawes, Michael Williams, Marco Galopo, and Antonia Zeifold. Now, any theory actually involves a complex layering of concepts, phenomenal, phenomenology, and mathematical equations. One informs the other. With more, better mathematics, you can refine your concept and you can do some more phenomenology and it goes round and round in various layers. And in order to do physics, you actually need to have predictions. You need to do phenomenology or nobody's going to take you seriously. You're just going to be a philosopher. Philosophers, philosophy is actually necessary and it's fine, but we do actually need phenomenology. And that phenomenology has been there for the timescape model on for a number of things. Um, and we're actually making remarkable progress now. And what um, I'm not saying that I am going to give you a quantum theory of gravity, but these are the steps that one needs to take. And it's going to occupy us for a good few decades, I think, but actually having a different model, actually exploring some of the foundational ideas is important. We don't need to be wedded to a model which was never part of the foundations of Einstein's equations. It's uh, the Friedman model it was there for other reasons, uh, but actually uh, once one starts asking the right questions, one finds interesting, interesting things about the mathematics as well. And Marco and I are actually finding that at the moment. So people want a revolution because there's a Hubble tension and I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Zach will talk about it more, but uh, 
with the timescape model, there has been phenomenology for a number of time for a long time. And uh, back in 2014, folk did make projections for the Euclid satellites. The Euclid satellite has now been launched. And from that, I could say, OK, I expect there to be uh, differences of one to three percent in the uh, Hubble diagram, and I can ex I know the the precision with which you need to test the distance redshift relation. It's varying by one to three percent at any of any short finite range, but over a long range, there's a big uh, lever arm, and so uh, I have predictions which and and the Friedman model does. After all, there's the Clarkson Bassett Lew test, and uh, this is going to be decided within the next six years, certainly, and maybe even within the next few years. So um, it's happening, it's happening now. What does this involve? There are a lot of questions. What's the origin of scale? Where is fine, Where is infinity in terms of scry, scry minus, spatial infinity, these null, et cetera? Um, all of that are the foundational mathematical questions I get to. So why is there an average isotropic expansion law, et cetera? Where is the transition scale? All of those things are the basic things that I address with the timescape uh, concepts. Uh, historically, we assume that there is uh, an average isotropic uh, expansion. We put it in by hand, but we don't need to. And that's the point. A theory, if it advances, should explain it. And uh, I have some of the ingredients, not the final theory, of course, nobody does. It's going to take a few decades, but um, these are the questions that need to be asked. And uh, we just need a data to ask better questions. The data is there, it's coming now, it's coming thick and fast. And it's really high time people stopped using this uh, century old model. It has passed its use by date, folks. Right, so what's the difference? What's the important thing? Well, it is non-rigid spatial curvature. So the kinetic curvature is not going to scale in proportion to the um, uh, a rigid term. It's going to scale differently in proportion to the void volume fraction. So there is a new essential function it's called the void the volume the the volume fraction of voids if we naught, and the whole point is that so we, because the volume fraction taking the cube root here initially it is tiny. So if we look here, this is these are uh, fits to the Planck CMB data. So at very large redshifts, it looks just like the normal model. There, are, it, so it's just that what is dominating at late times is emerging spatial curvature, which I call the kinetic curvature because it really is gradients of the kinetic energy which are important. People focused a long time on the kinematic back reaction. Well, what is that? It's tiny, it's small, but it's of the order of few percent and it's necessary and it, it is the back reaction of the positively curved voids, the stuff from structure formation, the interior of galaxies, the, the motion of galaxies and clusters, etc. That's where that comes from. Right, so there is a uh, sum rule. It is constrained uh, and these numbers are important. So we've got matter. So this is one, this is from the Bukut equations. Uh, and those numbers are important, those numbers are constrained, and uh, I'm going to run out of time, obviously. So anyway, there is uh, an average expansion law. It's different from Friedman. Uh, the uh, Hubble distance, what's important is the timescape model is the black curve. It interpolates between different Friedman models, which have different uh, matter densities, it is the shape of these curves which is entirely important. There, uh, uh, You can look at any redshift and break it up into various components involving pecu peculiar velocities, some expansion of the background, and uh, the important difference is that you've got to, uh, there is an ambiguity as to what you when the things are expanding, what is expansion and what is motion? I seek to answer those in a in a precise way, 
and understanding that actually involves things like the Bondi Metzner Sachs group. And so there is a degeneracy, and the degeneracy you can actually probe. Uh, I'm not doing it uh, that stuff uh, in this talk or in this model. So the important thing is that there are differences. All we need are a distance and a redshift, those observational quantities, and from that we can go away and write down exact solutions and come up with answers and come up with tests. And it's just in the timescape model, these are different. There's an extra thing that there are bare parameters and dress parameters, just as there are in quantum field theory. Um, but of course, this is classical. Uh, nonetheless, one can write down models, one can write down phenomenology, one can test things and look at the differences. And the differences are there and are coming out now quick, thick and fast. So Zach Lane is going to talk more about the Pentheon Plus data. An important, so I'm not going to go into all of that. An important thing is that you can see from bootstrap resampling that uh, with regular methods that things do not converge, and that's the Hubble tension. Uh, we actually have now new results after a suggestion of the referee of a better metho methodology rather than religiously following Nielsen, Gufanti, and Sakar and the timescape model. So this is a letter in preparation. It's new. It's going. It's not what Antonia is going to talk about here. She's going to talk about her own work on another thing. But uh, the timescape model now fits overall with a log B greater than five, that is to say, it is now at greater than 99% confidence. That's important. Um, so Chris Harvey Hawes is going to talk about strong lensing time delays. And again, this is completely independent, but there is a dimensionless ratio, which comes from velocity dispersions. And although the models themselves, the data is not correct, uh, in, in the sense that it, it, there has to be things wrong with the model, regardless of the, um, the problems there, you find that timescape models are being driven to a natural, the same values which are picked out independently by Planck, by supernova. They are independent tests and it's working. The most important thing for me now are the simulations involving uh, numerical relativity. So these are the simulations that Haley McPherson has done for a number of years. It's the old simulations, but we've got new methodology. We've first, for the first time, we're actually able to identify voids. So whereas uh, Haley always knew that the expansion rate appeared to be um, different uh, in, I don't have the expansion rate in this, well, so Mike will show it more in more detail, what's important is that we actually, by homing in on voids rather than just taking random volumes, which will give you uh, as much wall as you have void and therefore not actually find the results that we're finding, we do see the negative spatial curvature. It is there in the original simulations. Moreover, I do understand why uh, uh, Julian Ardemek and others, uh, what exactly the, the, the steps that they're doing, which appear to be, um, dis, it, it, things, things agree. So I, 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 don't, I don't have time for it more. I'm going to run out of time. So what is important are the gradients of the spatial curvature. It's the gradients and the way in which one approaches the asymptote, which is important, it's gradient of kinetic curvature, and the, the, the height of this peak is, is important, and it's because we've got a resolution scale of 4 over h megaparsecs, and I'm not going to make it this in time. So um, all I can say is that Desi, um, oh, actually, I might have a few more minutes. I might, I think, so I was, let's just go back. Back a slide. Yeah. So what is important are the gradients. And when you look at those gradients, so here the resolution scale is 4 over h megaparsecs, which is about the 
size of our finite infinity scale because we're a thin filament in a void and it actually um, is important. Your local environment's always important. Now, what Michael has done, so with Haley's simulations and stacking 30,000 voids, is to get out plots like this one. Um, and the fact that it goes to uh, 0.83 here is important because those and and here we're seeing convergence. So you have to look at it. Uh, you have to do salute, simulations with less resolution, with more resolution, and ultimately we're going to have to go and look at particle-based things as well. But what's important is the way in which you approach the asymptotic region. So here we are looking at the asymptotic region some, somewhere out here. This is stacking many voids. And th with the empirical profiles, uh, Michael is able to find much more detail in his simulations than others have found before. And we are also seeing residuals. And those residuals are setting new questions for us about the approach to the asymptotic region because the there is a quasi-local uniform Hubble expansion condition deep down to scales of four to ten to, uh, of tens of megaparsecs that say the quasi-local uniform Hubble expansion condition tells you why there is a regularity and it gives you a reason maybe for beginning to understand new questions about these residuals. So that's important. Those are the questions that we're asking. If you go and look at the DESI results, everything is a problem there for the standard model. Um, and but what they are finding is consistent with what we find. So of course there are many, many deep. Uh, there are many questions there that they have, and so I don't have time now. Now I'm really running out of time. But we have a team at the University of Canterbury. Some work in quantum. Uh, work in gravitational waves. So we're working on a number of things uh, and uh, you need large teams and it's a very complex system, uh, but we are now fully engrossed on all of this work. Marco Galoppa will tell you more about differential expansion. Uh, all I can say from the other work is that certainly the, the amount of dark matter has to be recalibrated. Morag, uh, is not speaking today, but we are interested in tests of the, uh, um, yes, and I'm going to be cut off. So um, all I can say is that there are a lot of things, a lot of interesting questions, and you can ask them uh, during the discussion session. Thank you.